Good morning and a very warm welcome indeed to today's Movers and Shakers virtual event. My name is Lena Tasha Salter and I'm Managing Director for Movers and Shakers. I hope you've all had a really good weekend and thank you to our members from across the UK for joining us this morning and also thank you to our newcomers. And for those of you who have not attended or indeed virtually attended one of our Movers and Shakers events, uh, we are the UK's leading property networking forum. We've got over 25 years now of experience in bringing together decision makers in the industry, private and public sector, enabling them to do business and of course putting on first class events. We're really enjoying our virtual events program at the moment. We hope you are too. And if you've missed any of these events, most of them are now uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So please do view them and enjoy and subscribe. Last week, we launched our interim Movers and Shakers membership, and this will carry us through till the end of the year to enable new members to enjoy all of our virtual events until the end of the year for free. And also, to when we start the physical events, hopefully in autumn, to join, uh, come along at the members rate across the whole of the UK. And we'll be tweeting all of our new members logos. So watch out to those and say hello. Back to this morning. Well, this morning we have one of our views from the top sessions, which are interviews with chief executives and leaders. And today we welcome Eamon Boylan, who is chief executive of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Eamon's going to be talking about regenerating and recovering, leading sustainable, healthy and inclusive growth. Now I'm delighted we've got Eamon with us today. Eamon is a hugely passionate individual, really passionate about what he does and he's very positive about regeneration. We're really looking forward to hearing his visions for further devolution, for the industrial strategy, for the transformation of healthcare and social care and he was responsible for six billion pounds worth of budget to oversee this and also on how he's going to unlock Greater Manchester kickstart responsible development. Interviewing Eamon this morning, we welcome Colette McCormack, who is partner at Winkworth Sherwood. Thank you to Colette for joining us. And thank you also to Winkworth Sherwood, who are supporting and sponsoring today's event. They are a full service legal organization. They are market leaders. They've got a diverse range of clients. They work on really high profile events and they're great friends and great supporters of Movers and Shakers. So I'm gonna let Colette ask the questions this morning, but please do ask a question too from home. Please type in to the Q&A tab and Colette will be able to see the questions and she'll try and weave them into the discussion if she can. It's a 30 minute session. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to Colette and to the highly ambitious and highly respected leader, Eamon Boylan. Thank you, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, and can I just um, also echo um, uh, Eamon's passion for GM? I've had the pleasure of um, chairing Eamon on a number of um, on a number of kind of panels. And um, at times like this, it's um, I think we take great comfort of having our, um, our civic leaders like Eamon um, being so passionate um, because we, we, we're going to need you guys to to lead us through. So I'm just going to start with a, a, an open question really, Eamon, in terms of um, what's been the greatest challenge, do you think, for GM um, while we've been in lockdown? What have been your biggest issues? And if you can also just touch on the um, social care as well, because that's something that's really, um, I know, really close to your heart and, um, and also something that's, um, that's that is is you know part of the devolution with with GM. So you know, has there been any issues with with that in terms of the lockdown? Okay, um, thanks, Colette. Good morning, everybody. Um, I suppose when we went into lockdown, we thought, "Good Lord, this is hard. This is complicated. We haven't planned for this. How do we respond as a as a whole system?" And it took us, I think, a couple of weeks to get our heads around just um, the scale of the challenge that we were, were facing not only in terms of, of health, but also the fact that we were looking at a much broader social and economic disaster, uh, rather than, uh, than simply a, 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 a simple, if I can use the term, simple pandemic. But if we thought locking down was hard, the hardest thing is now unlocking and moving from where we are now into a period where for the foreseeable future, we will have to learn to live with COVID. Because I don't think anyone is, putting significant amounts of their own money on, into the bookies on the chances of a, vir a vaccine arriving anytime soon. 
Um, so we're working on the basis that we're going to have to live with the virus as a, as, as a prevalent thing in, in, in the city region for probably the next 12 months. But trying to move forward in a way that respects the evidence, but also understands the political and economic imperatives that we all face uh, is, is a real, real challenge. And you know, uh, it's easy to knock the government. Um, and believe me, I do do that from time to time. Um, but the reality is they've got an incredibly difficult balance to strike. Um, and whoever it was that was in, in Downing Street, I think that would still be, be the case. So we're trying at a local level to make sense of things from uh, a system-wide and a place-wide um, uh, agenda. And that's been one of the interesting challenges. And I think it's shown up in, in a very sharp light some of the inefficiencies in the way in which some public sector agencies work in, in the country, where we have government departments that are still entirely focused on departmental silos or modal silos within departments. Whereas actually there's a real need for us to join up on, uh, on the ground. So, a lockdown in the case of a new outbreak will not be a public health issue, it'll be a civic order issue, it'll be a public realm issue, it'll be a community management issue. And that's something that we do need to respond to. You mentioned um, social care, and, and if I'm being frank, um, you know, we've been trying for a number of years to move toward a fully integrated health and care system in GM. We've made some progress, but not enough. And that was thrown into sharp relief when the, the lockdown happened. And any, if anyone says to you, uh, it threw, it showed, it, sorry, it showed very clearly that we had a strong focus on health, but an absolute lack of focus on care, they're not exaggerating. So we came very close to having to shut down a large part of our social care system because we simply could not access through the national pandemic supply any protective equipment for staff working in care homes. It was all being channeled into hospitals. And I understand why that's, that's the case. But the reality is we had to step up. And I had people working in China, in Japan, in Australia, in the United States, in Europe, sourcing PPE for us and importing it directly. So we were building our own stock. So that then we could have a system of mutual aid across health and care, where we had hospitals giving up PPE and the confident knowledge that we would give it back to them when, when they needed it. And that was something that I'm very proud of, the way in which we managed to respond and create a much more sustainable system across the piece. And I think that's something we could not have done had we not had the, the devolved settlement around health and care. Wow, and I think just kind of, um, when, when you talk about it in those ways, Eamon, we, we just realise kind of, you know, the breadth of everything the pandemic touches in terms of, um, you know, in terms of leadership and, and, and organisation. Um, in terms of, um, I suppose, uh, you know, obviously we, we all kind of think about all the challenging things that you've had to deal with. Are, are there any kind of positives to come out of this, do you think? Are there things that you're going to take away and think we'll, we'll build on that because that was something really positive? I know everybody talks about, I mean, personally, you know, the, the, the Nightingale hospitals, how quick they, they came a, a, around and were built. Um, it shows what happens when you have everybody working together and pulling together. Is there anything kind of positives that, that you think in GM will, will take away? Well, I mean, the Nightingales were a good example, uh, and everyone looked at people building hospitals in a matter of days in China, thinking, oh, you can get away with that there, you'd never do it here. Well, actually, we, we pretty well did, um, uh, despite the fact that um, some of my colleagues working in planning on looking at the listed status of the building in Manchester that was used were a little nervous, shall we say, about uh, how that, that adaptation took place. At the same time, I became the proud owner of a 1,200 um, space mortuary. I never realised I'd want to, to own a mortuary, and I'm I'm really really grateful that we hardly had to use it at all. Uh, but the way in which um, we just had to respond to get those facilities into play very quickly was was impressive. There are one or two other things that I might highlight as well. I mean, we've been working for a number of years to try and create something that I think most people assume already exists, but it, I can assure you it doesn't, and it doesn't anywhere apart from GM, and that's a single digital patient record that has your uh, medical details on it's accessible to a surgeon, accessible to your GP, accessible to your social worker, accessible to your care provider. It just doesn't exist. We've been working for years arguing about information governance. We had it up and running within five weeks at the start of the pandemic. And that's now the backbone of the integrated care system in, in, in Greater Manchester. And that's something that I'm, I'm really, really proud of. And the other thing to say is you know, on the health side, 
there are some real worries. I mean, we know that there are a lot of people who should have come forward to present to have advice or treatment for, for illness, and they haven't because they've been either reluctant to put a burden on the NHS or they've been scared, they don't want to go into the hospital because that's where you go and if you go to the hospital you die because that's where the virus is. Um, so there is an issue for us, a big issue is how we deal with, with the consequences of that. But at the same time, what we've done is create what we call the hospital in the home system. Uh, so I've got GPs now working with care homes in a new and different way. So the care home does not feel obliged to pick up the phone and phone an ambulance every time an elderly person shows any sign of illness. And people are being treated in their own homes, closer to their own homes, in their communities. And it's taken pressure off at a and &E in a way that we've never seen before. And if we'd not been able to do that, then I think we would have had some significant uh, problems uh, both here and, and elsewhere. So there are things that we want to keep. There, there, there are things that we want to make part of the new normal as we go forward that are different and have arisen as a result of the, of the urgency that we've had to show in, in responding to the pandemic. Well, I, I think that's brilliant. I've, I've heard you talk uh, with passion about um, the um, the uh, information management on, um, on on kind of having a centralised system, and um, it's fantastic that you've you managed to deliver that under such challenging circumstances. And as you say, I think we'll going forward. Um, you know, it's great to see uh, GM once again leading the way on on those types of initiatives. And I suppose that was one of the next questions I was going to ask you actually. Um, um, moving out of lockdown, because I think you're absolutely right, we're, we're, we're going to be living with COVID, aren't we, for the foreseeable future. Um, what, what, what are GM's priorities um, in, in terms of, um, you know, kind of moving forward and moving out of it? If I could perhaps highlight two, I mean, one, we have put a proposition to government to be a pilot for a new and fully integrated health and care system. Uh, and we're very, very keen to progress that, build on the progress that we've made on some of the achievements that I've already described and try and create a genuinely um, integrated system, not with the NHS necessarily taking over care, but achieving real parity of esteem between health and care settings and, 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 and services. And that's something that I think is, is going to be a really, really important element for us all moving forward. But we think on the basis of the progress that we've already made, we in Greater Manchester can help lead the way, as it were, on, on that. And that's the discussion that we're having with the government. But the other big priority for us, um, uh, amongst, amongst many, is how do we um, re-energise and reinvigorate the Greater Manchester economy? Um, because we've seen a, a more than doubling in claimant rate already, uh, and that's while furlough is still in place. Um, we know that we're going to see very, very considerable negative impact on things like our hospitality industry, which is so important to a major city, all major cities in, in, in the UK and across the world. But we know that a lot of businesses are really going to struggle to come back online, particularly if we can't deal with social distancing in a more central way. We may, of course, see some difference in that as we move forward. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to have a, a sensible discussion with government on something again that we've been talking about for a very long time, which is how do we create a localised and focused and targeted and accurate skills and employment system for people falling out of the labour market who may need to think about moving into sectors they've never contemplated before, um, but where there will be demand as, as, as we move forward. So having a localised skills system that enables us to respond to the realities of the marketplace as we find it in GM or in Leeds or in Liverpool is going to be really, really important. And the reality is, that while national programmes can set priorities, they can't flex quickly enough and they can't react quickly enough to local circumstances. So that's one of the big uh, agendas that we've been, again, we've, we've been talking to government about it for a long time. I think we're getting a more sympathetic hearing from government now as a result of the recognition on their part that we need to move in that direction as well. So those are just two of the big things. And, um, and, and maybe they could also, as you say, be some of the kind of positive things that com, come out in kind of um, post-COVID, isn't it? Because again, skills um, and you know the, the join, joining up the dots, I know, is something that um, I've heard you talk about passionately on, on you know, and, and not just you, but the other GM leaders as well. Yeah. Um, so it's it's great to kind of get that skills um, workforce on back on high on the agenda, isn't it? In terms of, um, I think you're absolutely right. I do think we need to kind of get the, get the economy going. And, and I think there's a general will, isn't there, from everybody to kind of, you know, get out and support our high streets or support our local businesses. Um, I mean, you know, I certainly feel like that and everybody I'm speaking to in, in you know, in 
in Manchester feels like that. I suppose one of the key questions that will that link into that is, is not just the social distancing, but um, but transport. You know, how how are we going to deal with transport? And, and and I say this from someone who our offices are, are you know right next to Piccadilly Station, and I always jumped on the tram from here at Furswood, and um, you know, and 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 but but I'm working from home at the moment, and it is one of the things that looking at with my staff kind of. When's it safe to go back on tra public transport? Because we don't really want everyone to get back into cars either, do we? But, um, so, so what, what, where, where do you think we're going to go, kind of in terms of public transport? Well, I think to offer people the choice of um, using something that they don't trust and don't regard as safe, or jumping in their car, and those are the only choices, then I think uh, we, 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 we will fail. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment, and we've got a very substantial bid into government. I think we're going to get an announcement this week on an allocation of resources, but in, in the order of 20 odd million pounds, just to put in place emergency arrangements to enable people to cycle more safely. Um, uh, and we have seen a significant upsurge in the number of people actually defaulting from public transport to bicycles. Um, having said that, it tends to fall off a cliff every time it rains, which of course it does occasionally in Manchester, as, as you know. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, more uh, more walking. So I, I live, um, my local station is Furswood. I'll be walking into work when we get back into the office in order to try and not because I don't want to use the tram, but I think while we've got limitations on capacity, it's important that I leave it to people who really, really need to, 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 to use it. But it is interesting the, the conversation that we've been having with government where they're saying you've got to step your services back up, got to run 100% of your capacity on rail and tram and bus. We're saying that's great, um, but show me a business model where it says I can incur 100% of all my costs and overheads and only expect between 5 and 10% of my normal income to support that. Show me a sustainable business model built on that. And the reality is, if for the foreseeable future, we will need to be putting public subsidy into public transport in a way that we haven't done for decades, uh, except in London, of course, but don't get me onto the funding platform for TfL. Um, we're all feeling very bitter and twisted about that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the reality is, you know, on one of my lovely yellow trams, um, uh, I can normally get 220 people if they're crammed in like sardines. At the moment, with social distancing rules, I can get 20. So that's the limit uh, that, that we're working to. And the reality is, as retail has reopened over the last seven days, we're actually at capacity already in terms of social distancing on, on public transport. Now, Whatever rules are announced this week um, about reducing distances while wearing masks and all the rest of it, we may well make a difference. Uh, but we need to find ways gradually of building people's confidence back up because I can create some capacity in public transport, but will people actually have the confidence to use it? And that's why we need to keep working and gently promoting this. But for the last 12 weeks as a transport authority, I've been sitting here putting out messages saying, don't use public transport. Ah, and it's, it's, it's sort of crackers, really. Um, but it's a it's reality that, 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 that we, we, all, we all face. Um, but I think the other thing that I would say is, I think what we'll see, and I don't know what your plans are at Winkworth Sherwood, but I think what we will see is people taking a very gradual approach to the way in which they reoccupy their space. And we know that some big employers in Manchester City Centre have got no intention of putting their workforce back in full this side of, of the new year. Um, so I think, and I think a number of them will say, well, actually, this working from home lot um, seems to be okay for some of the time. So therefore, do we need the space that we've got? So I think the knock on effect in terms of potential demand for commercial space may well be quite significant as well. And that's something that's, you know, from, from an industry perspective, we need to be, be, be concerned about. Um, but yes, you're right, and transport is absolutely part. And what I can't do is I'm trying to promote a clean air and low carbon agenda is just say to people, jump back in your diesel and, uh, and, and, and drive into work because we just can't cope. Uh, particularly if I'm putting up cones to, to protect cyclists, the capacity on the road is going to be reduced apart from anything else. So there's a, there's a whole series of conundrums that we need to, to, to deal with. Nothing, nothing easy. <clears throat> No, there's nothing ever easy about transport, is there? <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, we, we're sure we're, we're probably doing the same as everybody else, Eamon. We're, we're trying to follow government advice by asking people to stay at home. Um, and we're doing, like you say, encouraging people not to use public transport. But, you know, we, as you say, um, you know, it, it's, that, it's that conundrum, isn't it? Because it's trying to get, you know, it's trying to get the economy and trying to get that confidence back. Um, 
I've got a question in from the audience here that says the rise in working from home will give rise to more opportunities for Mancunians as the link between people's physical location and work is broken. It's obviously um, represents a risk. Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what um, what what the point what what the issue is there about kind of physical. Maybe is that kind of breaking between having to go into the office every day. Um, but um, so um, in in terms of in terms of coming back though, because we keep hearing this um, this phrase as well, Eamon, like build back better. Yeah. What, what 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 do you know? How do we how do we build back better? I suppose. Have you got any kind of, I know there's never any a magic bullet for regeneration and, and, and delivery, but, you know, have you got any kind of views of, of how we will build back better in, in our new challenging times, I suppose? Well, um, build back better sounds very much like a bricks and mortar piece. It's not. It's about how we rebuild uh, our, our places um, uh, and, uh, and our services. So some of the things I've talked about in terms of new ways of delivering public services, new ways of increasing the efficiency of public services that we've been forced into through the use of virtual technology, I think are part of that building back better. And those are things that we'd certainly want to maintain. But I think there is now a realization, certainly um, within, within government, you know, to be clear, money may be tight for, for, for a, a substantial period of time. But there is really no point in us moving on now with that, some of our traditional norms and how we approach development. We really have to now be grasping the neck about the, whether it's a 2038 or a 2050 target for carbon neutrality. How are we actually pressing ahead with that? How are we pressing ahead with things like um, uh, decarbonizing and, and cleaning up our air? So we will be, for example, engaging in a full public consultation on introducing a clean air plan as part of our building back. Um, which you know, some people might think is a rather perverse way of doing it, but it's an essential thing that we need to do as we move ahead. And I'm delighted to say after about six and a half years of trying, we've, we are going to go out to public consultation on the final draft of the spatial framework in the autumn as well. Um, so that's, I think, going to be part of how we'll frame our policy approach to building back better in environmental terms, in, 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 in transport terms, and in, in connectivity terms, and, and, in, and in design terms. So I think, you know, it's, a, it's a easy to bandy around, you know, a nice alliterative phrase like build back better. But I think there's a real opportunity for us to try and do something and change the, the nature of the dialogue. It's going to require changes in the way that local and national government work to support development. That, that, that much is very, very clear. Um, but I do think that, you know, what we're seeing um, uh, uh, it creates a potential for us, uh, but also the, the challenge that we face has to create a potential for us to do things differently. If we thought the town centre's agenda was important before this happened, well, my God, you know, what, what, what do we do with Oldham and Rochdale and Stockport town centres? Uh, we have to stick with it, we have to keep the faith. We have to work towards integrated, higher density, more sustainable development, of mixed, mixed type in, the, in those places. So I think there are some real opportunities for us. Um, but we think it's more or less an intensification of what we've already been doing rather than a radical reversal of what we've been, been trying to achieve. But I think, as I've said, with some of the uh, issues where we've managed to make rapid progress in extremists, as it were, I think there's an opportunity for us to make rapid, rapid progress in terms of redevelopment and build back. Well, I'm sure everybody listening in today will be delighted to hear more news on the spatial plan. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can never have you on a panel, Eamon, without asking you about the spatial plan. But, no, no. I mean, uh, I, effigy sales um, uh, of me uh, to, in Greenbelt locations, are going, the, the, the volume is going back up again. So, <laughs> but but, um, but I agree with you. I think, um, I, I think one of one of the and I was you know a lot of the kind of talk in the newspapers over the weekend was kind of how will we go back to things? You know, do we use this? I mean, it's been a terrible thing in the pandemic, but do we? You know, how do we use this to kind of shift the dial, as you say, to kind of look at important things like um, air quality and, um, yeah, and, and, and the you know, sustainability agenda. Um, I, I think it's really important, as you say, that we start to take those, take those on board and maybe engage in it in a different way, or maybe it comes higher up people's agendas. Now people realise what it's like to not have um, you know, so much cars on the road, so much pollution. I suppose one last question is that, do you think there'd be, because um, you've talked about different ways of central and, and, and local government um, and uh, regional government working together, which I think is really 
interesting. It'd be really interesting to hear your views on that as, as months go forward. But do you still think there'll be that importance of the public and private sector working together? Um, and, you know, will we, will we require that kind of joining up of public-private even more so than ever before? Uh, I think absolutely we will. Um, just a, a very simple example. I mean, if you are the owner of a significant number of commercial buildings in, in any city, Manchester or, or wherever, um, how do you deal with the changing challenge that that poses in terms of shifting demand and all the rest of it? What policy framework do you need to have in place with local planning authorities to enable you to do the things that you know that you need to do in order to maximise the, the opportunity that, that that space creates? It's a very simplistic example. But I just think we need an urgent dialogue about you know, what, what's changed and therefore what do we need to change in the way in which we collaborate across the public and private sectors. And I just think that's going to be essential. And on the, the skills agenda, we need to make certain that private business is absolutely engaged in the co-design of whatever it is that we're doing around skills and education moving forward. Um, because you know, the public sector is adept at coming up with the wrong answer to the wrong question. Um, uh, and so we, I think there is a real need for that, for that dialogue and that intelligence to help shape and inform uh, what it is that we do. So both in human terms and in physical and, uh, 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 terms, would, I think that dialogue is going to be more important than ever. And, and I, I absolutely agree, agree with that. And I think what's, what's great is that, as you say, um, you know, the private sector sometimes has different ways of looking at things and the public sector is taking the, the best of both those things. I think I'm, I know that we're approaching our um, end of our conversation with you. And I think what's been really important is um, hearing that, um, you know, kind of our leaders are, you know, looking across the piece, joining up the dots, um, already thinking about kind of what's going to happen, as you say, in the skills agenda and our, our vulnerable uh, members of society, ensuring that um, ensuring that they're, you know, looked after as, as we move forward and move into um, hopefully a recovery part of, um, of um, you know, recovery of the economy. So it's always great to, to speak to you, Eamon, because um, I know that you're passionate about, about those issues. And it's, it's, as I say, I said at the beginning, it's great to hear our civic leaders picking up the points and, and, and ensuring that um, all those things are, are delivered. Thank you very much and uh, always glad to talk to you Colette. Well thank you very much to Colette and to Eamon. That was absolutely fantastic. Well I knew it would be but um, it was great Eamon to hear such passion I think and such pride in what you and your team do and rightly, rightly so and it's interesting to to understand you know that the devolved powers and how important that is and you know we need to go for further devolved powers uh, moving forward but thank you so much to Colette for very ably chairing this morning's discussion thank you both and just to remind our audience that we'll be uploading this video onto YouTube so you'll be able to watch it again or refer your friends to that will be on our YouTube channel and our next Movers and Shakers event is this Friday oh, sorry this Thursday even and it's 10.30 and it's our second panel session on Build to Rent and it'll be about investing in Build to Rent. Tuesday the 30th we have a panel with the New West End Company all about repurposing the West End. Lots more to come, we'll keep you updated. Thank you for viewing today from our family to yours. Take care, thank you. <laughs>